Let me first, first of all, just make a, a quick statement about um, the individuals who will be presenting. For me, um, when we decided on doing this tour, the first person, and I'm being truthful to you, the first person I said to our team was, we have to get Dr. Sanchetti. He is going to be our keynote, and we've got to make sure that uh, we can get him on board. And this is, goes back to a very long history, over decades, that I've had the privilege and pleasure of interacting with him and his father um, and all of the wonderful faculty and trainees at the Sanchetti Institute. So with that, if I can just move to introduce our guest, who will then introduce our keynote. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Sunny Gugle, who will, is an orthopedic surgeon at the Sanchetti Hospital. Um, he is also with Galash Patel, uh, who's also a diploma, uh, has a diploma in orthopedics, an orthopedic surgeon, and also at the Sanchetti Hospital. Uh, gentlemen, welcome, um, and uh, thank you very much for participating. Yeah, hello, good evening all. <clears throat> Let me introduce our keynote speaker. Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Let me introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Parat Sanjeti. He is a chairman and practicing orthopedic surgeon at Sanjeti Hospital with 25 years of vast experience. He is a specialist in arthroscopy and joint replacement surgery with specialty interest in knee surgery. He is the dean of our postgraduate college and he has been a mentor to many postgraduate orthopedic surgeons, including myself. He has many accolades to his credit. Recently, he has been awarded the doctorate, honorable doctorate degree from University of Dundee from UK. He has been a founding member and past president for many organizations globally and in India, like the APAS, ISH, and ISM. Handing over to you, sir, for your keynote lecture. So your mic is off. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Yep. Okay, uh, great. Uh, uh, good morning to our guests and uh, the people who have joined from USA. Good evening to the delegates from uh, India. I think it's indeed a great pleasure to you know be here and uh, speak on this uh, Insights World Tour. Uh, it's an interesting topic which uh, I have been given, management of severe deformities, what do you do? But before I begin with my talk, uh, let me introduce uh, our uh, initiator for this, or let me just speak about Mohit Bandari. You know, the association with Mohit Bandari goes to 2006, 2007, when he actually inaugurated our research department when uh, late Dr. Steve Rocha was there. And uh, after him, uh, Ashok Sham took over the department. And I must at this point of time, uh, thank Mohit Bandari for initiating research at Sanchiti Hospital. And it was uh, Hemant uh, from McMaster University, he was from Pune, introduced us to Mohit. And then Brad has been coming very regularly and helping us with the uh, Pune trauma course. So, you know, Mohit uh, has been really instrumental. He keeps coming to India every year, sometimes twice a year, and has been instrumental in helping us uh, uh, with our research activities and we owe a lot to him. And also thanks to Ashok Sham, who is taking these uh, activities further. All of us know he has been very active with the ortho evidence. He founded that in 2009 and has received you know, many, many accolades. Uh, 
he needs no introduction for that but one of his recent uh, feathers in the cap he recently received the order of canada award which is indeed a very prestigious award so congratulations uh, mohit for that is indeed so nice for you to have received that i think one of the most busy person since the lockdown and since this uh, uh, covid pandemic started is mohit bandari and also ashok sham i think uh, these people are really very very busy and i think mohit must be sleeping just a few hours and uh, he has been really very very active he has done many po uh, podcast he has uh, done very uh, webinars he has set up guidelines which keep changing and if you visit ortho evidence it's really good and uh, uh, it's okay So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. It's excellent. But before that, no, we. Yep, screen is seen. So are you seeing it now, or could you see it before? No, we we couldn't see it before. We no, we can only see it now. We see it now. Ah, uh, okay, perfect. So this is uh, <laughs> uh, nice. I just missed some slides, but this is uh, what I just wanted to you know uh, thank Mohit. Uh, for all that he has done mohit you've been coming very regularly and this is when you inaugurated our uh, research department and when uh, steve rocha was there late steve rocha 2006 2007 after that brad has been coming very regularly and uh, uh, visiting us i think that's been really great and uh, you know you come you've taught us every year or sometimes twice a year and it's, it's been it's been fantastic mohit thanks for helping us with our research at sanchedi hospital and i just said that you know you've been really busy you started the ortho evidence and recently we are so proud that you received the uh, order of uh, canada award which has indeed been so so uh, fantastic and we are proud of all the accolades uh, you have received to mohit it's fantastic and i just said that ever since the lockdown started you've been very busy and you've done so many things you've done podcasts you've done webinars you set the uh, practices for uh, covid era and set guidelines which are dynamic which keep changing on your website so so you are doing fantastic work mohit we we really appreciate all that and uh, thanks for having us speak on you know the severe deformities so if you see in uh, uh, india uh, we very often see these kind of deformities and uh, uh, as ortho arthroplasty surgeons this is something Uh, what we see very regularly, and when we see this deformity, is the question which comes to my mind is: Is TKR uh, the only options? And the answer is: Well, uh, it is not. So, what are the other options we have? The other options are: It could be an osteotomy, but osteotomy in these kind of uh, situations in arthritic knee, I would say, is out of question. Fusion can be done, but people want movement; it's not a good option. sometimes we can leave them alone and that can be an option to consider uh, when it's end stage uh, but but the for the most times i think a totally replacement is something which we should go for what happens in india is that the patients uh, uh, come very late uh, it's severe deformities by the time they come and some of them actually get adapted to the situation and are very happy with the situation so if you see the natural history of osteoarthritis what happens is that in the end stage arthritis there is a situation where they actually become painless and at this time of uh, you know this point of time what we need to do is actually leave them alone we can give them intraarticular hydrocortisone uh, injections and these patients become painless you know they have a deformity they have issues but like this lady i have been following her and you know uh, she is actually painless and is is doing Uh, 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 very well in terms of uh, not being operated. So I think this end stage arthritis uh, does uh, come in, and if they have uh, been painless, we can leave them. Just support nature, and we see how they go. But for the most uh, times, I think knee replacement is what we recommend to our patient. And when we do a knee replacement in these severe deformities, the uh, question is. are these really the same are these really different from our conventional knee replacements which we do in less deformed knees 
So I think uh, what I would say is that the various deformities which we see very often in our practice are 90% uh, of the times and, and most of these are very, very severe deformities with bone loss, uh, unlike uh, the conventional deformities. And when we have to deal with them, there are some situations uh, where we need to keep many things in mind. As a principle, I think knee replacement is all about balance. In various knees, you've got to release the medial structures. And in, in valgus knees, you've got to release the lateral structures and get the balance. It's, it's all about getting the balance. And you get a, a good balanced knee uh, with correction of the mechanical axis uh, in the sagittal as well as the coronal plane, then you've got it. So that's the important thing in, in tackling severe deformities. Uh, so let's talk a little bit of various deformities. So what the first important thing is to find out whether the deformity is correctable or whether the deformity is not correctable. And if the deformity is correctable, then it's a different thing. And sometimes it's partially correctable. So how do we find out whether it's correctable or not? So we like to do something called as a valgus stress view. And uh, this was something which was taught to be by my father and uh, uh, as we call him fondly KHS, uh, he always insists on a valgus stress view. So you can see here, this is like a varus with 35 degrees uh, varus deformity on a weight bearing X-ray. And once you give a valgus stress, it opens up and you can see that there is a big bone defect and this is a correctable deformity. So it goes on to show that there not much release would be required. And when it's a fixed deformity, it does not really correct. And there you know that the like kind of medial release which is going to be required is quite high. So that is a very important X-ray that is the valgus stress view in varus deformities and a val varus stress view when you're doing a valgus deformity is important when you're dealing with severe deformities. You need not do it every time. Uh, all of us are aware that there, there, there are three main bony cuts whenever you're dealing with any knee replacement. And for me, the proximal tibial cut is important because that's the one I take first and the other cuts are based uh, on top on that. And uh, uh, for me, I start with the uh, distal femoral cut and then go to the proximal tibial cut, which is taken by the, you know, putting the jig and it's at 90 degrees to the mechanical axis. And I cut about uh, seven to eight millimeters in severe deformities. We should uh, actually cut less and then move on to the other cuts. Here, the, the main principle in severe deformities, friends, is that do not cut too much. You know, keep the bony cuts uh, to as uh, minimum as possible because if it's a severe deformity, then if you cut more, then your poly thickness is going to be much more. And this is the sequence of releasing the medial structures. You go on the medial side and release it in sequence. Don't release everything at one time because if you do that, what's going to happen is uh, it's going to really cause a problem and you may over release at time. So go sequentially and release uh, bit by bit to see whether the knee is uh, getting balanced in flexion as well as extension. In severe defects, you will quite often see that there are bony defects there and they can be three types of defects, the contained defects, peripheral and composite. And depending on the depth of uh, the defect, we can manage it just by cementing cementing and screw if it is between four and eight millimeters. And if it is more than eight to nine millimeters, you need bone grafts or augments. And this is something which you have to keep ready uh, in uh, while doing knee replacement. And you may have to add constraint and Dr. Kailash will speak to you about that. There are three important additional steps you have to do while dealing with severe deformities. One is the release of the posterior medial structures. And that is best done in a figure of four position as you can see here. And uh, you know you go posterior medially, externally rotate the limb, and then release posterior medial structures, which is very important in these severe deformities. The second thing is the pie crusting of the medial structures. I sometimes use a 16 gauge needle uh, or use uh, 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 11 blade and make eight or nine uh, punctures, and that helps quite well to release uh, the medial uh, tight structures. The last step which I do in case the knee is not balanced, is to do the superficial MCL release. And that goes about uh, eight to nine millimeters from the joint line. So don't release it all the way. I would release it only up to six to seven centimeters and leave it because in case you blow that, then you definitely have to add constraint and Kailash will tell us about it. 
I think the important thing here is to understand that whenever these deformities are there, study the case. You know, for example, this was a case, a 65 year old lady. This was a virus deformity, a fixed deformity. And this was the kind of bone defect. And what I do is the medial sleeve is, I, I tag it. I take two sutures with Vicryl uh, number two and then keep it uh, tagged so that later on for me, the closure becomes quite easy. Uh, then this is building up the bone defect as you can see here. And then once the joint is done, you can close very well and see then severe deformities also, you get an airtight closure because of the previously tagged uh, medial structure. So that's an important step which you have to follow. This was a post-op X-ray. Here we added constraint, the long stem, and this is how you can see how it's uh, lady is walking. One of the important tricks, uh, friends, is to have this reduction osteotomy. So you actually can undersize the tibial component one size, place it a little laterally, and uh, cut the excessive bone on the medial side. This helps by correcting the deformity by reducing the denting effect and helps in closure. And you can actually reduce the size also of the tibial component. And that way you can balance of the knee. So a useful trick is the reduction osteotomy. This is one of the examples. You can see this lady, severe osteoarthritis. This was quite painful, hardly able to walk. You can see the bone defect on one side. You can see there was a pathological fracture with a non-union. And then we had to do bone grafting in this case. This is called as the rectangular slot technique, which was taught to us by uh, our mentor, uh, Dr. KHS. Uh, and this is called as the KHS technique, where you press with a graft inside and then you know fill in the defect. And it helps this defect is taken from the proximal tibial cut bone and fits quite well. This was the post-op x-ray. We had to add constraint again to bypass the defect. And you can see the uh, defect, uh, medial defect, which was uh, filled with screws and the non-union, which was helped with the stem. And this was that follow-up. You can see the pathological fracture has healed well. And the lady is able to walk well without any problems. Uh, very quickly, as I come to the last part of my talks, we also see valgus deformities in our practice. It's about uh, 7 to 8% of our cases. And most of the times, these are rheumatoids or sometimes metabolic uh, uh, bone disease. The technique is, uh, in terms of balance, remains the same. You know, you release the lateral structures. And I like the outside uh, release and outside in technique and release the tight structures uh, as we go on. One of the key issues here is when you take the AP cuts, and I don't go by the technique parallel to the tibial cut because you know, after taking that, if you use the parallel to the tibial cut because of the bone defect, you may go wrong. So here I use a combination of the epicondylar axis, uh, the white sides line, and compare these two and use that uh, as my guideline for doing the AP cuts. And that becomes useful even if there is a lateral condylar posterior defect. This was another case, as you can see, the valgus deformity. This patient, uh, we did a knee replacement, did not need to add constraint. And this was the post-op x-ray, and this uh, really helped. In severe deformities, you've got to keep in mind, uh, friends, is that you may have to do a lateral epicondylar osteotomy and do that, take a big chunk of bone and move that uh, distally, or with distal, you move it proximal uh, or uh, anterior or superior, depending on the valgus deformity, if it is associated with a fixed flexion deformity or hyperextension, and then fix it with a screw, it's a useful trick to have in severe deformities. Some of the complications we can face because of the valgus deformities is the common peroneal nerve palsy, especially when you're pie crusting the lateral structures. If you go more than uh, one centimeter inside with your blade or with your uh, 16 uh, gauge needle is that you may damage the common peroneal nerve. So do not penetrate more than eight or nine millimeters and be very careful while doing the lateral release because you can damage the common peroneal nerve. The second issue we have in valgus deformities is the patella tracking. So here, if the patella is not tracking well, release the tourniquet and see if it is not tracking. If it is not, do the lateral retinacular release from inside out or at times even from outside in and don't leave unless it balances well. And here is something you know very important to see whether your femoral component is placed right. This is my last example. This was a patient with windswept deformity. You can see the patient has a varus on one side and a valgus on the other side, uh, barely able to walk. We did a bilateral knee replacement and you can see the bone defect here. And once we did that, we had to add constraint 
we added long stem we could get a good correction of the deformity in the proximal uh, uh, in the mechanical axis in the coronal as well as the sagittal plane and you can see your post op x rays this is the flexion we achieved and the patient was walking well so that was really nice so this is the algorithm i follow in valgus knees find out whether if it is corrected uh, correctable or not if it is not correctable you know then you can decide whether you want to use a lateral parapetal orthotomy or a medial parapetal uh, conventional orthotomy and for me i always nowadays use only the medial conventional parapetal approach and then depending on the flexion deformity if present we decide whether to add a epicondylar osteotomy then we decide whether to add constraint and one of the important things is the competency of the medial collateral ligament if it is incompetent incompetent you may require to add constraint in terms of a hinged implant which you will hear from uh, kailash so friends in summary it is important when a patient comes to you with a deformity which is severe to assess uh, the deformity whether the deformity is correctable whenever you are offering a knee replacement do a stage release uh, ensure that the patellar tracking is good if it is a valgus knee always in these cases prefer a ps implant a cr knee those who use it for please for deformities like which i showed don't use a, a cr knee ps is always preferred and then keep constrained uh, as a backup I, i want to leave you with a message that please if you see severe deformities follow the principles i just talked to you but don't wait so long if you see them in your practice early catch them young because it has been shown that the outcomes of a conventional tkr in a non complex knee is much better and the longevity is much better than you do a tkr in severe deformity when you add constraint at times the loosening is higher fusion is an option but don't consider it in certain cases you can just give intraarticular dermatomedrols and make the disease end stage arthritis burn it out and then leave them alone if they are painless so friends to answer the question which we asked is tkr the only option uh yes and i would say in 95% of my cases it is but there is a subset of patients whom you can kind of avoid it but then you have to select those options those 5% really well uh with this i really want to thank you thank mohit and the ortho evidence team thanks uh, abhi for having us here and i i really uh, feel that this severe deformities is going to generate a lot of questions but before we have that Uh, it's my duty now to introduce to you the next speaker he is my colleague at the department of uh, knee surgery at sanjeevi hospital dr kailash patil he has an experience of 15 years in uh, arthroplasty he has worked in uh, uh, the catherine hospital in germany he has been a, a fellow at the hss hospital in new york as a ranavat fellow he has done the eska fellowship in europe he has written many articles and has chapters written in textbooks to his accolades so it's my proud privilege to present to you dr kailash patil who will speak to us on speak to us on how to add constraint or how constraint helps in knee replacement so thanks friends uh, over to kailash patil thank you yes brad thanks i i'm I, I... Yeah, I'm. I'm just using my hand clap reaction. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. So much. Yeah. Hello. Yes, yeah, Kailash. See wrong. my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Parag Sanjeevi, uh, for uh, this talk. So first of all, I would like to say a very good evening to everyone in India and good morning to everyone uh, in the states and Canada. uh first of all i would like to thank dr mohit bhandari and ortho evidence and insights tour for giving me this platform uh just now we heard dr parag sanchiti speak quite elaborately and extensively about uh, knee deformities and severe knee deformities and how we correct them with uh, total knee arthroplasty uh however uh, in this part of the world uh, what we see is patients come in quite late with late stage arthritis and there's a lot of issues with bone deformities bone defects and soft tissue uh, cover along these uh, knees so uh, my topic today is adding a constraint in cases of total knee replacement yeah so just click on the slide kailash yeah 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 one thing twice 
Okay. So severe knee deformities is a constraint really required in primary TKRs or in revisions. So the need for constraint in severe deformities when the soft tissue envelope lacks and to compensate for it, we use a constraint prosthesis. What exactly is a constraint? It's adding a mechanical stability through an implant design in order to counter the forces which otherwise the soft tissue or the bone would have offered uh, uh, as a support to these uh, things. So we need to answer three questions. One is why we add a constraint, when we add a constraint, and how do we add a constraint? So in cases where there is a soft tissue about the knee which will not support the prosthesis which you're going to put primarily, loss of key vital supporting structures, in such cases where a prosthesis which really accommodates for this loss of support, we use a constraint. Uh, when do we use a constraint? Uh, one sec. Uh, in addition to these severe deformities, inability to balance these flexion extension gaps, flexion gap laxities, most commonly we see this mid flexion deformities or mid flexion laxities. Uh, in cases of extension gap laxities, which is quite rare, uh, and also in cases of global instability. So how do, are we going to go about these level of constraints? Uh, so basically we start right from uh, cruciate retaining uh, prosthesis go on to a cruciate substituting. We may or may not add a stem component as we saw in earlier talk by Dr. Parak Sanjiti, a lot of patients did have a constraint in the form of a stem. We can add a high post, either a TC3 or an LCCK could be an answer. A hinge prosthesis, like a link prosthesis. Uh, but, and last but not the least, a tumor prosthesis. So the decision to add a constraint uh, can be taken either preoperatively or intraoperatively. Preoperatively, what we need to see is uh, whether there is a ligamentous laxity and uh, as Dr. Parag mentioned, uh, if there is any incompetency of the ligaments, there may be severe knee deformities with or without bone defects. Non-unions at the meta or the diaphyseal regions also require uh, use of a constraint. Neuropathic joints, uh, post-traumatic uh, arthritic uh, joints, uh, revision pro surgeries and tumor prosthesis. So, Intraoperatively, there may be an over-release of the medial collateral or the lateral collateral, intraoperative fractures, inadvertent ligament injuries where a saw might have a cut through the MCL or the LCL uh, and may give instabilities, flexion extension gap imbalances, and avulsion injuries which may be caused to in cases of patellar tendon, in cases of MCL. Uh, so the concept of modern TKR uh, is either a constraint or a non-constraint. Basically, the amount of inherent built-in stability which is provided by the prosthesis is a constraint. It ranges right from least constraint to the most constraint. Uh, in the least constraint, it may be a non-link prosthesis uh, ranging from cruciate retaining, cruciate substituting, right up to constraint condylar knees. In a link prosthesis, you may either have a non-rotating hinge or a rotating hinge. So how to increase a constraint in cases of cruciate retaining uh, prosthesis? It's either by adding a cam and a post, it applies minimal constraint. We may have design changes to the cruciate substituting prosthesis, may use an ultra congruent or a deep dish design. In all such cases, what we need to understand is a good soft tissue envelope, well functioning collaterals, a well balanced knee, which, which will give us and which is important for an optimal function of the knee. So uh, in severe deformities, a PCL may be incompetent. And in such cases, we do use a cruciate substituting uh, prosthesis. It helps in better gap balancing. It has predictable kinematics, a better conformity, and less polyethylene wear. At times, when we don't want to use a cruciate substituting, we may use ultra congruent or a deep dish design, which may substitute for uh, a posterior substituting uh, uh, prosthesis. In cases of non-link prosthesis, the most important is the constraint condylar knee. In such cases, it offers a coronal stability. It does give a varus valgus and rotational stability. It has a higher uh, TBL post or a tall TBL post, which kind of accommodates the box inside the femur and gives a stability. Uh, so this is one of the cases which we did uh, in Sancheti Hospital. This was a bilateral neuropathic joint with incompetent uh, ligaments and a lot of bony loss. So she had a bilateral windswept kind of a deformity and we did a LCCK in this. So this was a staged total knee replacement which uh, we did with a constant condyler. First the left was operated and then the right was operated. 
So uh, in cases of linked or a hinge prosthesis, we may use a rotating hinge or a non-rotating hinge. It has the highest level of constant. Coronal, sagittal and rotational stability is provided. It is used in cases of complex revision arthroplasties, complex instabilities. In, cases, in some cases of oncologic surgeries also, basically it has an axle that restricts the varus, valgus and translational stresses. A lot of times when we're using a non-rotating hinge, there may be a septic loosening, which is more common in uniplanar hinged knee devices without a rotating hinge and which prohibits a rotational motion. So uh, these are a few cases where we did a hinged uh, prosthesis. This was a bilateral windswept deformity. On the left side, there was a complete loss of ligamentous stability along with a porotic joint with a lot of bone loss. So the best choice for this implant was this uh, knee was directly going in for a constant condylar, uh, for a completely constrained knee, which was a hinge or a, a link prosthesis. This was another case, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in complex revision cases, this was four times operated totally, uh, which were, which failed ultimately, and we had to go in for a tumor prosthesis. So in constrained, in constrained knees, we do use a tumor prosthesis. So in summary, insufficient constraint risks the failure from instabilities, more the constant, it predisposes to aseptic loosening and bone loss leading to failure of the prosthesis. It's important to understand the concept of const constraint needs and when to use it. So we should not think that a constraint can compensate for a bad surgery. It should be kept as a backup for complex situations and in cases of severe knee deformities. Sorry. So I... So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Parak Sanchiti, for uh, giving my elaborate uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Mohit Bandari, for giving me this platform. Uh, I would like to introduce my, our next speaker, that is Dr. Uh, Sunny Google. He's my colleague uh, at Sanchiti Hospital. And he has an orthopedic uh, experience of 10 years. Uh, he's a special interest in knee surgeries, in reconstructive and replacement surgeries co-authored a book on comprehensive guide to joint arthroplasty, which is the alpha compendum of uh, the APAS group. He has numerous book chapters and research publications to his credit. Over to you, Dr. Sunny Google. Yeah. Hello, all. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, after we have seen the principles of deformity corrections uh, extensively and the use of constraints in such deformities, the next task in the such patients is uh, post-operative pain management because these patients will have acute pain because of acute deformity corrections and stretching of the soft tissues. So getting the uh, effective post-management, uh, post-operative pain management and getting them to rehab faster with early, early return to functional activity is the mainstay of the effective pain management. So the multimodal pain management approach is used in all such patients, which involves preoperative patient counseling, preemptive analgesia, the regional anesthesia, the intraoperative in cocktail injections, pre postoperative NSAIDs, injectables, and transdermal patches, and other combined anesthesia modalities in total. So preoperative counseling is very important. We should have a dialogue with the patient, uh, explain that the anticipation of postoperative pain is going to be there and that reduces the apprehension of such patients, which is an important key. We should always stay ahead of pain. So it's easier to prevent pain than to treat it. That's, that's the role where pre analgesia comes into play. They prevent the obnoxious stimuli before they come. So we use Celebrex and uh, pre in our patients, which have shown uh, in many publications as well. Next role is of the regional anesthesia. So we, uh, it can be spinal anesthesia, epidural anesthesia, or combined spinal and epidural can be used and they offer a significant advantage over general anesthesia in regards to post-operative pain management, which can be continued post-operatively as well. Epidural analgesia is extensively being used and uh, uh, is currently also being used. We restrict ourselves to bilateral patients and we can attach infusor pumps in such patients, which gives uh, good post-operative pain relief for at least 24 to 48 hours. There are certain cautions to be taken when you're using this epidural analgesia is to be aware of the epidural hematomas especially in those who are on antiplatelet drugs because of other cardiac comorbidities. And special caution is to be taken in patients who are have spinal deformities or with angst patients. And these patients usually need uh, urinary catheterization and they have to a certain extent of cortisol weakness. 
which delays their mobilization. Intraoperative pain management with intraarticular cocktail injections, which is a mixture of uh, local anesthetic, the antibody, uh, epinephrine, clonidine, and a steroid, is injected in the periarticular area, which can give effective postoperative pain management. Uh, pain control for around 24 to 48 hours. There are various uh, cocktails have been described by many authors. And very, uh, if you so, see this slide, the commonest thing in this is the anesthetics and the opioid. And the thing that varies is the use of antibiotic, corticosteroids, and the and in the epinephrine. So corticosteroid has a certain role, but there are certain select indications that it can be used because it, because of a lot of contraindications to be used in diabetic patients and other uh, they can uh, apprehend local infection so to, uh, cautiously to be used the uh, use of corticosteroid once we have seen the intraoperative pain management the postoperative pain management is an essential aspect and the, it continues with the intraoperative pain management so epidural analgesia or anesthesia which was given intraoperatively can be continued with an infusive pump and uh, postoperative peripheral nerve blocks as an important aspect of post op pain management other oral anesthetics and transverse patches can also be used. So peripheral nerve blocks, this is an area of common interest by the anesthetists as well as the orthopedic surgeons. Uh, various types of peripheral nerve blocks are being used for post-operative pain management of which the commonest one which was used and is used now is a femoral nerve block. This is the injection into the femoral nerve block. Uh, many anesthetists, they claim to have uh, just blocked the sensory uh, sensations from the femoral nerve, but usually these patients have some amount of motor weaknesses and their rehabilitation has to be delayed because of cortisol weakness. But yes, it has a certain role and gives extensive pain relief and should be done ultrasound guided. Adductor canal block is a very important thing which is now uh, which has uh, taken over the femoral nerve block because it uh, avoids the uh, catheterization of such patients and uh, minimizes the motor weakness and allows faster rehab. We can also place uh, catheters into the adductor canal which can be effectively used for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and it is to be done ultrasound guided. IPAC is a thing which has been introduced recently and uh, it's very excellent uh, pain management because it gives excellent analgesia without any motor blockage, which uh, involves injection of the uh, local anesthetics between the popliteal artery and the knee, capsule, knee joint capsule. It uh, specifically uh, targets the genicular branches uh, and the articular branches of the common peroneal nerve. It also has to be done ultrasound guided and gives ex effective pain relief uh, for the post-operative pain management. Post-operatively, uh, once this initial 2-3 days period is over, then we substitute this patient with uh, oral or injectable or transdermal patches. And uh, various combinations of groups can be used. Uh, special uh, concern is of use of NSAIs in patients who are having cardiac comorbidities. Uh, there we tend to use a lot of uh, opioid or non-opioid analgesics in the form of transdermal patches and they give effective pain management. Our protocol in preoperative patient is to give pre empty analgesia. For regional anesthesia and unilateral patients, we prefer spinal anesthesia supplemented by post-operative femoral blocks and repeated uh, blocks if required on day two. In bilateral patients, we use spine, combined spinal and epidural anesthesia followed by an infuser pump which is used for around two days. And later on, we move on to oral as well as transdermal patches. The post-operative pain management, we use uh, celecoxib, which is uh, used in a dose of around 200 milligram for 15 days. We supplement these patients with cryotherapy, which also has an effective uh, role in pain management. Other rescue analgesics in the form of injectable tramadol, paracetamol can be used for breakthrough pain. And certain patients uh, who still, after doing this all, they still have persistent or un unrelenting pain. For such patients, we use epidural top off at times, repeat the nerve blocks, or at times use injectable, injectable pentazosine and phenarbin, which also gives excellent pain relief. So to conclude, patient satisfaction uh, post uh, such severe deformity correction is more important. And if pain is uh, significantly less, these patients are happier. It reduces the length of hospital stay. It reduces other medical coma complications. And as of now, recently we are speaking a lot about daycare TKR. If where effective pain management is of prime importance. So to improve, uh, so we have come to, uh, far away from the improved perioperative pain management using multimodal approach. There is no standard pain protocol which can be uh, used for all the patients because each patient is a different one and everyone has to have uh, made a tailor-made protocol. 
so pain uh, so we are surprisingly we have seen that patients who are in admitted in general wards are better with their pain management in than those in the dealers room this is just a uh, simile i like to thank dr bandari and dr parash anjati who give me this platform to convey my thoughts about post operative pain management